Inflammation is extremely important, and it's a, an example from the second line of defense. So that's the first thing that we're going to talk about. So inflammation, it's going to be triggered whenever the body the tissues themselves are injured. Could be a little cut, um, many, many examples. So trauma, heat, chemicals, burns, infections by microorganisms, in, in the case specifically of the immune system. So the benefit of the inflammation is it localizes the infection, keeps it just in one area. The last thing that we want is for it to spread system-wide. And it also increases the repair of these injured tissues. So uh, the four main cardinal signs of acute inflammation are redness and healing. And this is going to happen because there is dilation of blood vessels. There's also swelling that's going to compress the nerves as well as pain. So again, the four signs are redness, heat, swelling, and pain. So signs of inflammation, when this happens, is the first thing is that there are inflammatory chemicals that are released. There's a whole bunch of them. There's vasodilation, increased vascular permeability, so more cells come in to help out and phagocyte mobilization. So our inflammatory chemicals are shown here. There is histamine, which you undoubtedly have heard of, especially around allergy season. Histamine is stored in the granules of mast cells as well as basophils. And they're released in response to mechanical injury. There's chemicals released by the neutrophils as well. There's what are called kinins, and kinin is a plasma protein, essentially split from another chemical, prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are fatty acid molecules, but they're going to have the same effect as histamine. So you can see that all these basically do what histamine does. They cause vasodilation, allow for more chemicals to come in. And then we have complement and cytokines. And there's a whole bunch of these. You don't have to know the individual ones at all. Just realize kind of what they are and that they're part of the second line of defense. So there's inflammatory chemical release, which happens first. And in this example, histamine, as we just discussed, is released by mast cells. It's a super key inflammatory chemical and it attracts macrophages to come there to help to destroy any foreign invaders. The other inflammatory chemicals that were in that table were kinins, prostaglandins, cytokines, and if other pathogens are involved, complement. So all of them basically do the same thing. They cause vasodilation of the local arterioles so more blood can get into that capillary area. So the capillaries are leaky to allow for the um, chemicals to get where they need to get. So um, the response to injury is the vasodilation increased vascular permeability. So there's a surge of fluid that happens and that's a sign of inflammation. That's a good thing because the surge of fluid uh, sweeps the foreign material into the vessel, lymphatic vessels for the processing in the lymph nodes. Also important clotting proteins could appear that are needed. Then there's phagocyte mobilization. So I always like to say the neutrophils are the first on the scene of the crime. The neutrophils show up first and the macrophages are going to follow. And if the inflammation is due to pathogen, complements activated, and also the third line of defense, the adaptive immunity, plays a role as well. So the steps for phagocyte mobilization are leukocytosis, the release of neutrophils from the bone, and these occur here we see all five of them, or all four of them listed on this slide. Leukocytosis, these neutrophils coming into that area. Margination, which is when the cells are inflamed and the vessel 
lumen itself, it basically grabs on the passing neutrophils. It says, hey, come in here, we need your help. So it causes them to slow down or to roll so that they are attached to that area and can come in for help. There's something called diapedesis. Diapedesis means that neutrophils are going to flatten and they're going to squeeze between the endothelial cells. Because remember, the, ca the capillaries, they become more permeable. The next thing that happens is what's called chemotaxis. And in this case, there's specific chemicals that are going to attract the white blood cells to the area where there's a problem. So white blood cells are drawn to this area of inflammation. So as the attack continues, monocytes could arrive later. And remember those monocytes, they transform into macrophages. They're kind of the cleanup crew, the late arrivers. They replace the dying neutrophils which have, gone, have, have, ha have done their valiant job, their valiant effort. So phagocyte mobilization is what we see here. We have the four different steps. Leukocytosis happening first, the neutrophils entering the bone from the bone marrow. And those neutrophils need to get to the area where the problem is. So the margination is essentially the idea of the neutrophils sticking to the endothelial cells. The diapedesis is the flattening of the neutrophils so that they now can squeeze through this area into the, the tissue area. And the chemotaxis is where the neutrophils follow the chemical trail. It's almost like the idea of pheromones. They're releasing these pheromones that are going to attract uh, white blood cells to the area of, that's problematic. So the events of acute inflammation, this looks like a really uh, difficult slide, so we'll um, go through it a little slowly here. So first of all, the four main cardinal signs of inflammation, again, are heat, redness, pain, swelling. And you should know the general re region or reason for these happening. Uh, first of all, there's heat and redness because our tails are going to dilate. And when they dilate, there's going to be more blood flow into that area. That, the term for that is called hyperemia. The reason for um, swelling is that there's going to be increased permeability. And this is going to end up attracting all of the neutrophils, monocytes, lymphocytes, whatever's needed to deal with that pathogen at that present time. And we have finally the... Um, you know, this is all from the release of these chemicals that were in that chart. So then we see leukocytosis happening, the leukocytes migrating to the area, margination, diapedesis, and phagocytosis, what we just saw on the previous slide. So this slide is showing microbi antimicrobial proteins, and antimicrobial proteins are part of the second line of defense within the innate defense. And just like, as you would expect, it directly attacks the microorganisms, hinders their ability to reproduce. And the most important ones are interferons. And what interferons do is they interfere with the replication of the virus. So they don't allow it to divide anymore. Interferons are sometimes used in the treatment of cancer. Then there's complement proteins, and there's a bunch of these, which you don't have to know, but these are some of the things that it does. It enhances cell lysis, encourages phagocytosis, and also inflammation. So the um, other thing that can happen with antimicrobial proteins is fever. Fever is a good thing. It's obviously a really um, pain when we have it, but remember, it's a good thing. And the abnormally high body temperature is the systemic response. And leukocytes and the macrophages are going to secrete pyrogens, which acts on the thermostat and the hypothalamus, raising the body temperature. But the benefits are specifically that it prevents microbial growth, microbial proliferation, 
by essential substances that are unavailable to them. So it kind of takes away the necessary food that's needed. So um, to sum up the different factors of the second line of defense are the phagocytes, the natural killer cells, the inflammatory response, and the antimicrobial proteins. And again, you don't have to know the specific ones, but know that interference and complement are the two examples of antimicrobial proteins.